How's it going, Yankee fans? Welcome back to Fireside Yankees with your boys, Alex and Ryan. Today, we're discussing three prospects that we think should relatively be untouchable for this Yankee team. And, you know, we know the Yankees are looking at the trade market. We know they're in, engaged in the free agent market for whether it be Jordan Montgomery or Blake Snell. We've talked about all the trade options in terms of, you know, Dylan Cease and Corbin Burns and Shane Bieber and Jesus Lozardo and, you know, everybody under the sun. The Yankees have been linked. And, and this is normal, right? A lot of teams use the Yankees as leverage to boost up the price. For example, Yamamoto, we all thought he was a locked coming to the Yankees, but, you know, we got that price up because, you know, this agent, Joel Wolf, decided that, you know, the Yankees are a big spending team. If we leverage them, we might be able to get an extra 25 mil, um, you know, of course, out of out of uh, the Dodgers, and they got it. So now you look at all the other options on the market, and you're going to have to pay above market value for guys like Snell and Montgomery coming off two of their arguably best seasons in their careers. You're going to have to pay a little bit much. You're going to be overextended. And, you know, if you're Brian Cashman, Ryan, and you're thinking to yourself, I got to spend big money on these two guys, th those, the regression there, the, the downside of those contracts could be something that gets you fired straight up. Like, I don't think Cashman could afford to miss out another contract. You know, Rodon's deal is already looking like a major, major mistake. We think he can bounce back. We still have to see it. If that ends up becoming a huge mistake and he signs another guy that regresses and doesn't perform, you're looking at, you know, a guy that's now locked this Yankee team into hundreds of millions of dollars of bad money after already locking them into a bad contract with Stanton, you know, obviously Jacoby Ellsbury, and the list goes on. So we have to avoid that. Now, there are a couple prospects that we think shouldn't be on the table. The Yankees can easily go out and get a guy like Shane Bieber. Maybe not easily, but I think that they should be targeting a guy like this that won't cost you an arm and a leg. But the three guys that we have in mind, you know, Spencer Jones, Jason Dominguez, and Chase Hampton, should be untouchables right now. And I think that unless it's a deal that you can't refuse um, for a player like Corbin Burns or whatever it might be or Dylan Cease, I, I still think Jason Dominguez should be legitimately untouchable. He should not even be a starter in any conversation. How are you feeling about those three prospects and if you think that any deal will be worthwhile considering if they're included? And also, how are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing great. And as you mentioned, you know, looking at what the situation with Jason Dominguez is right now, um, the Yankees need young talent to supplement expect expensive talent because of the fact that it's cost controlled, um, it allows you to make other maneuvers. As you mentioned, you know, and I talked about this a little bit yesterday too, the Yankees are in a position where a third starting pitching contract, that's massive, right? Like a long-term, multi-year, like six, seven-year deal. That means over the course of the next five years, you're going to be paying, you know, Cole's in his 30s, Rodon is in his 30s, and then if you pay a guy like Snell or Montgomery over seven years, that's the third guy in their 30s. Um, and, you know, just from a perspective of trying to win baseball games, I mean, Alex, I don't know how many teams would want to invest uh, long-term capital, and we're talking, you know, 80 to $90 million between three players at a position like the pitching position where injuries are more frequent. Um, you know, the, uh, pitch, the pitch, the, uh, pitch clock is shortening. Having a shortened pitch clock, I feel like is only going to increase the amount of injuries. I think baseball is kind of dropping the ball in that regard. I think the pitch clock was fine this year in terms of, you know, what it was trying to do. I actually enjoy the pitch clock, but extending it feels like a little bit much. Um, but you know, looking at what the Yankees are trying to do, they're trying to assemble a sustainable winner for, uh, for the long run, right? Like winning baseball games is about what you do. Obviously, you know, we're, we're looking at the 2024 Yankees. We're trying to win the world series. You have Juan Soto guaranteeing your team for one year. You do have to make the effort to go all in, in a sense, but you also have to understand, like you are planning at some point to try to keep Juan Soto long-term. The goal is for him to be a Yankee for the long, for a very long time. Like, if the Yankees are going into this without the idea of, all right, how do we keep Juan Soto long, t long term, they're thinking about the right way. And I doubt that they're thinking of it from the perspective of we're only going to have Soto for this year and we're not going to even think about bringing him back or he's not a guy we really want to bring back. Um, but, you know, ultimately, as you mentioned, Shane Bieber's kind of a guy that on the trade market you can get realistically. You know, I kind of want to float this out here, too. Uh, you know, just as Jason Dominguez is considered a headliner in a deal, I believe Spencer Jones should be put in that ilk of a headliner for a massive deal. Like, if we're talking about Corbin Burns, we're talking about, uh, you know, or, or guys with multiple years of control, you know, Dylan Cease, Jesus Cesardo. The way I look at it is Spencer Jones is an adequate headliner for that package. Um, and if they feel like he's not... I might even entertain the conversation with them. Uh, you know, I think Spencer Jones' defensive tools are excellent. I know there's a lot, a wider range of outcomes offensively. He's a bigger guy. Um, there are some questions about how he'll hold up, you know, in terms of swing decisions and all that stuff. But this guy is a true, like, elite, elite athlete. Unbelievable speed. Unbelievable arm strength. Unbelievable defender. 
And most importantly, you know, and look, I know that some people don't want to hear this, but when it comes to offense, your ceiling is kind of determined by your ability to hit for power. Uh, the best hitters in baseball hit for power, right? Like Luis Arise is the best contact hitter in baseball. He has never, ever, and he will never be considered close to as good of a hitter as a guy like Aaron Judge, right? That it, that's, it is what it is. And Spencer Jones has the ability to hit the ball 118, 119 miles an hour. So, you know, ultimately I look at those two outfielders and I say, these are guys I want to build around. These are guys I want to anchor my lineup. And kind of the big thing here, and I feel like this is a departure from some of the previous, uh, you know, top prospects we've seen coming up because, you know, you had Glaber Torres, who's probably your best position player prospect in the last half decade, where right? Aaron Judge is obviously your most successful, and he was one of the better prospects to come up. Um, but these two guys are switch hitting and left handed, right? Like these two guys hit from the left handed side of the plate. I think that's big for your outfield. You're going to have an outfield where at least two of your guys are left handed or switch hitters. Alex. That's something I want to build around. I want my two big, I want my big guns around Aaron Judge to be left-handed, right? Like, I think that's an advantage. That's, you have the short porch. And more importantly, you get to beat right-handed pitching more often. And who's the most frequent type of pitcher you see in baseball? Right-handed pitching. So I think the math just adds up. Those are two guys where it would take a lot for me to consider moving them. I mean, look, a lot of uh, a lot of systems out there, a lot of the ranking systems for prospects have Spencer Jones ranked as our number one prospect. And you know, personally, I think Jason Dominguez has earned that right, um, having hit a home run off Justin Verlander. But you know, it's it's really just semantics at that point. The, the truth is this: Jason Dominguez is already our starting future in the outfield. I don't think Alex Verdugo comes back next year, um, or in a long term deal. I think that you have Jason Dominguez either filling left or filling center field, depending on Aaron Judge's health and desire to keep playing in center. Um, I think, you know, if they extend Juan Soto, he's locking down a corner outfield spot for the next 10, 12 years. Like that's, or at least for the next couple of years until he transitions into a DH role following Giancarlo Stanton's eventual departure. Um, You know, I I think that Jason Dominguez is a key component in this outfield for the future. A unit that was really bad last year could turn into a unit that is one of the most feared in baseball in two years, or rather in 2025, if not this upcoming season. You know, Jason Dominguez, Juan Soto, and Aaron Judge, you can't convince me that that outfield alone isn't going to power an offense or like a nuclear reactor for an offense man you can't find better than this in terms of upside uh, maybe there are more proven groups um you know as as a whole and defensively but dominguez is a switch hitter that lefty bat of sotos and judge hitting 60 plus homers you know you're really not going to find anything better than this. I, I really don't think it's a, it's a question. Um, maybe another a couple other teams compete in that regard, but it's hard to argue with that level of upside. Um, now, you look at Spencer Jones. How does he profile in this exact scenario? He joins this team. Maybe he transitions to first base. Maybe, you know, uh, Judge or whatever, they, they kind of flip-flop those guys, give some guys rest, whatnot. Um, <clears throat> I'm inter- interested to see how they get him involved. But Spencer Jones could be your center fielder. This dude was a 6'6 freak athlete that stole over 40 bases last year, guys. You don't find these players very often. Guys like this don't stumble upon your team. You don't stumble upon 6'6 players that steal 40 bags a year. It doesn't happen. It's not something that's a regular occurrence in baseball. This guy could be special, man. And look, he's had some trouble with his chase rate, his whiff rates. You know, obviously, his on-base percentage was around 33% this past season and high in double-A. Needs to get better. But if he puts it all together, man, Spencer Jones could be something that we truly unique. You know what I mean? Not only a freak defensive player with a tremendous arm. He was a pitcher before he had Tommy John surgery. The guy's got a sick arm arm strength. But also the level of competency as a well-rounded player, right? Hit for power, hit for contact, excellent defense, steal bases. He can hit all over the lineup if he gets that on-base percentage up. Um, this is a guy that could be something really, 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 really unique. And I'm not, I don't want to sell on that right now. You know what I mean? Like you're holding a golden, you're ho- holding the Willy Wonka freaking golden ticket. You just got to go cash it in and see what you, see what's there. You know what I mean? You just got to go see what the, what the prize is. I, I think that that's really what you're sitting on right now. A player that has that level of upside, you're holding the golden ticket. You just got to wait to get that reward. And I think it's going to take a little time. He's 22 years old. But by the time he's 24 years old and he reaches that potential, keep in mind, people will mention he's 22, but he has one year, two years of, of MLB experience, of, ML, of minor league uh, experience. So he's still really young in his growth and development stages. Um, I think that he will make his MLB debut, if not this upcoming season, in 2025 as a potential starter. If Juan Soto signs elsewhere, you have a young outfield with Jason Dominguez, Spencer Jones, and, and Aaron Judge. And, you know, you can survive with that as they grow and develop. Um, again, I, I want to extend Soto. Let's get it, Let's get that straight right off the bat. I want to keep Soto here for the next decade. But if the worst comes to worst, you have a really solid young outfield with generational type of power um, all over the field. 
field there. So, you know, it's not the worst scenario in the, in the world in, in a different universe. So, you know, love Spencer Jones. And then Chase Hampton, man, he's our last, he's like, our, aside from Will Warren, he's like the last remaining pitcher that we haven't traded away. Chase Hampton is something special too. Mid-90s fastball, you know, six spin rates, really good stuff. He has a really good pitch mix. Um, this is a guy with just all the stuff to be a really good pitcher in the MLB. Someone that you can ask to be a bullpen piece to start his career, transition into a regular starter. He pitched a lot of innings last season. He was excellent in Hudson Valley. Had some hurdles and adversity in Double A, which is arguably the most difficult of the bunch to adjust to. But we saw fl- signs of greatness. We saw flashes of greatness. And he's a you know good strikeout pitcher. I think that this guy in Chase Hampton, he he's been one of our top guns for a while now, for the last year, two years. I feel like we're looking at a player that could truly be a starter in this league. We just need to give him that little bit of more, a little bit more time of development. Now, if if you're sitting on a deal and it's Chase Hampton as the as the primary piece, and you're trying to get Corbin Burns, you're trying to get, I'm gonna move him. You know what I mean? Like Cor- Chase Hampton is probably the most willing of the bunch. I'm willing to move in a big blockbuster deal. But again, like if we don't have to, I'd rather not. You know, what, what makes you so excited about Chase Hampton in terms of his potential, his upside? How do you think he can make an impact on this team in the near future? Yeah, so for me with Chase Hampton, it's the power fastball, it's the excellent cutter, it's the sweeper he's developed, it's the excellent curveball. He has four plus pitches in his repertoire, fastball slider, or or sweeper I guess, to right-handed batters. You've got the fastball curveball for uh, left-handed batters, can mix in the cutter to both lefties and righties. This is a guy who has plus multiple plus pitches, whose command has gotten better, whose velocity has come up a tick uh, from college. He's 93-95 now. Um, can can hit some of the upper levels of of the of the 90s. Um, and ultimately, if we're talking about a guy with 93 to 95 mile power velocity and 18 inches of vertical ride. Like that's pretty good. Like we're talking Garrett Cole territory in terms of vertical movement. That's going to be a pretty good pitcher. Like, that's going to be a pitcher who gets a lot of swings and misses. And trust me, he got a lot of swings and misses. He got plenty of strikeouts. He racked up, uh, uh, you know, 77 in 47 innings in high A, 68 in 59 two third innings in double A. Um, as you mentioned, hit a little bit of a road bump in double A, kind of, you know, slowed down as the season went on. Uh, and that makes sense. He was extended out for over 100 innings. This is the first time in his career. He threw it at, uh, close to 100 innings, like he had been around 55 in college. Um, the Yankees tweaked a lot in his mechanics to improve. Um, and, and look, I'm not saying he's going to break the team with the team uh, on uh, in spring training. He's not going to make the opening day roster or anything like that. Um, but Alex, he can put himself in a situation where, you know, maybe he's in AAA to open the year. His stuff really is that good. And the Yankees seem to really like him. Um, and, and I, I'm telling every Yankee fan, like, I, I promise you guys, you know, there, I know that we've been disappointed by prospects in the past. There have been guys who've come up who have not succeeded. Um, but I think that's kind of overblown in a sense. Yeah. A lot of guys come up and don't succeed. That's true of any organization. I looked at the top 10 prospects like the Rays organization back in like 2020. Too many of them panned out, like maybe a couple of them as like fringe major leaguers. None of them have become, you know, stars. That happens, right? If you if you collect a lot of high caliber talent, you're going to have more guys come up and fail, right? The more young players you have that are capable of debuting for major league team, the more guys are going to come up and fail. That's baseball, right? Um, yes, the Yankees trade a lot of these guys away, but they're always in contention windows. So why would they hold on to guys, right? Like there, there are a lot of questions that kind of answer themselves for the Yankees. And, you know, I know that we're going to get the first thing that I'm going to look at in the comments and see is probably something that calls those prospect huggers and say, you know, we're not, we don't want to go for it. We don't want to win a World Series title. We don't care about winning a World Series title. No, we do. And we want the Yankees to, you know, do what it takes to win a World Series title. But we also understand that the Yankees have to do things that keep them sustainably good for a while because we know as Yankee fans, we couldn't do 10 years of being mediocre or terrible. And as somebody comments, well, we've been doing that for the last 10 years. Tr- trust me, we like I- I'm a Knicks fan. A- Alex does Fireside Giants. There, there are levels to mediocrity and, and, and terribleness, right? This is a stretch of playoff, frustrating playoff baseball, which is infinitely better than uh, what the Knicks were for really most of my life until now and what the Giants have been for the last 10 years, right? So, like, the Yankees are always going to try to be sustainably good, and they're always going to try to put themselves in a position to win. Um, and I think a guy, like, developing a guy like Chase Hampton, it, it, that's, that's a statement, right? You have Chase Hampton come up, and, and his stuff translate, and he becomes, you know, a middle-of-the-rotation, not even an ace, a middle-of-the-rotation kind of guy, you know, a good number three starter, 
and you've got him, Rodon, and 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 Cole to anchor your rotation for the next, you know, for the foreseeable future. I don't know how many years exactly. Uh, you've got a good rotation, right? And, and then you start seeing, you know, you can you can spend a little more in free agency because you don't have to buy a fifth starter, um, you know, or third starter, excuse me. You obviously have Cortez who's still on their arbitration. You have Schmidt who's cheap and controllable for the next five or four years. Um, ultimately, like the ability to develop these guys and turn them into productive major leaguers. That's what guarantees your ability to go out and be aggressive in for agency, right? If the Yankees have to spend on third base, and, and even if it's $10, $12 million here and there, that stuff adds up. I, I've always said this about the Yankee payroll. The Yankee payroll feels high without a, a, a lot of superstars. Now, this year's team is different. They have Juan Soto. They have Aaron Judge. They have Garrett Cole. The payroll is going to be high. But in years past, like last year's team, was it was a high payroll team. Where were the superstars? It was Cole. It was Judge. Rodon was supposed to be a superstar. Didn't work. Um, Stan was supposed to be a superstar this year. Hasn't worked. Rizzo's making $20 million. Lomeki's making 15. Hicks is making 10. Donaldson 25. Like that stuff adds up. That money quickly turns into, it goes from 80 to 90 to 100 to 120, 40, 150, 160. You throw an arbitration, all that stuff. Alex, the Yankees have to finally be able to run payrolls where it's high because they have superstars. It's not high because they have dead contracts. And fostering really good young talent that's how you avoid those situations it's a balance and it's hard to find where exactly that balance should lie i don't have a perfect answer nobody's gonna have a perfect answer but what i do know is that if this guy and i'm speaking of chase hampton here if he comes up and, and his stuff maintains where it is in the minor league levels he's going to be one of the best young pitchers in the game like i'm gonna be that confident i'm gonna go bold here this guy's stuff is really that good alex yeah, I mean, that, that would be ideal, obviously. And I think that you, you the point you made that really resonates with me is the balance of having those big contracts and those young those young pieces. And that's kind of what we were saying a couple weeks ago before we got sold all these all these guys. You have to have a balance between high contracts, like big contracts, and young guys in, in arbitration, even pre-arbitration, some of them. So, you know, I, I think that after 2028, you know, when 2028 comes around, we take the buyout in Giancarlo Stanton's deal. Um those bad contracts need to be gone, right? Like Juan Soto, if we extend him, like he's going to be a great player. Garrett Cole still very, very good. Aaron Judge will always be a very good hitter, in my opinion. Uh, I think most people would agree with that. Even if he transitions to the DH one day, he'll be a good player. So, you know, you look at, and also that contract's going to look like a steal down the road. So, you know, you're looking at um, what you have now, great sustainable talent, and guys that aren't busting in their freaking first season. You know, Carlos Rodon is is already bad. Like, you know, we hope for the bounce back, but he was bad last year in the first year of his deal. That's Those are the unsustainable things. Juan Soto is going to be great for a long time. You know, even if he has a down season, he'll bounce back and be great the next year. Like, he's that level of talent and that level of confidence. Um, he's, a, he's a monster. Those are the guys you extend. Um, the Yankees have taken too many too many gambles on injury-prone players. That's, that's my take. Can't do that anymore. You need to go out and get, like, Soto's of the world lock those guys down for for 10 years like those are the guys you sign long term and then you you develop young talent in in hopes of uh finding those cheap alternatives you know, like a peraza like a volpe like a spencer jones like a jason dominguez like a chase hampton like a clark schmidt those are the guys you 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 need to step up and make positive contributions and impacts at a very cheap cost but guys always happy to hear your thoughts below on the prospects we mentioned chase hampton spencer jones and jason dominguez do you think they're untouchable do you think that they should be traded you know obviously a lot of nuance a lot of conversation to be had there but i think for the most part i would really like to keep those three guys if we can um if it's a deal that you can't refuse then yes obviously i'm open to moving probably jones and hampton i think jason dominguez is off the table altogether um he's 20 years old dude i mean people forget that people forget that he is 20 years old and hit four home runs in eight mlb games you saw a flash of what he can do just a freaking glimpse just a, a small light a small sample size of what type of production this guy could have Let's not give up on that, man. We've held him out of every single freaking conversation, Luis Castillo, all of it. And this is the chance that we have to get him involved and really give him that job. We're at the freaking finish line. Let's 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 get to the finish line. You know what I mean? So always happy to hear your thoughts below. Make sure to like and subscribe as always. And we'll catch you guys on the next Fireside Yankees episode.